Now, a, uh, a, a word of warning. This is not a terribly inspirational session. This is nuts and bolts, nitty gritty, little details. You say, you know, why do I have to worry about this? But, you know, getting a million point seven dollars is inspirational. And so I'm going to talk about the kinds of things you need to do in order to get that inspirational one point seven million dollars. Most of the questions that I get come from budget areas. And so I'm going to spend the bulk of the time on budget areas, but I won't be restricted to that. I will also be covering some other areas to make your proposal stand out and more competitive. You'll notice that I use a checklist format. You'll see that as we go along. And the idea here is not for me to talk about every single point. I'm going to go through some of the points and talk about the more important ones. But the idea is that you have a document that's useful to you after this session that you can use before you start in earnest on your proposal, that you can use to refer to during the proposal. And after you're just ready to submit, you can go look through the checklist and say, yes, we've done that. Yes, we've done that. It's not an exhaustive checklist, but it's a reminder of the most important things that you want to cover. Now, before I go into the checklist itself, there will be some additional resources available once you take the survey after the session, and Catherine will tell you about that at the end. Uh, in the session last week, the 101 session that Jed did, he had some slides of COVID-19 uh, opportunities and resources. They're coming fast and thick. And we've updated that to a more recent list, and those will be available once you take the survey after the session as well. All right, let's go for what's really important with the proposal. Now, registrations are listed first because they are the most common hang, hang up. They can take a long time to do. So you need to give yourself four to six weeks to make sure that all your registrations are in place. These are the key registrations you have to have. Your corporate entity has to exist as a corporation. It's got to be registered. It has to have a taxpayer number. Your corporation also has to have a DUNS number from Dun & Bradstreet. And you get that by logging into Dun & Bradstreet and filling out their information in their online form. And it's officially free, but the cost to registering for a DUNS number is that they will hound you forever to buy their $200 service package and their $400 service package and their $800 service package. And you don't really need that. So whenever you get the advertisements from Dun & Bradstreet, you can say, no thanks, I'm good with just the free form. This is changing, by the way. Then next fall, I probably won't have this part of the presentation because they're switching to a uh, counting system or a numbering system within SAM.gov. So SAM.gov will be issuing you a number instead of Dun & Bradstreet, but that's still in flux. And maybe it will still be in place in the fall if COVID-19 prevents them from doing it this summer like they had thought about. Grants.gov, you must be registered for. And in addition to that, you have to have a registration in an agency website. And each agency has its own website. You know, DOD has its own, DOE, all of them, they have their own website. So you have to have the agency website as well. Now you might say, wouldn't it be nice if they all had the same registration website so we didn't have all these different ones? And the answer to that is it would be nice. And that was the idea of founding Grants.gov around 25 years ago. When they came up with Grants.gov, it was to be the response to all um, these various sites. But Grants.gov was so poorly implemented that having the individual sites actually is a lot better than having to use Grants.gov. It was that bad a lot better, but it still has a lot to complain about it. Here's a note. If you're a faculty member uh, at a university, I'm specific to the University of Illinois, but it applies to any faculty, you need a business account separate from your university account. If you have an individual account with the University of Illinois on Fastlane, then you also need an account with your business on Fastlane, separate account. I get that question a lot. Also of note for NSF, subcontractors must be registered in Fastlane, not just the contractor, but the subcontractor. And you have to register with the SBA with the registration. Uh, this, this is very simple and easy. You can do it in 10 minutes. You fill out their form, it's easy, and then they give you a PDF with the registration documentation. You send the PDF or the number in the PDF with your application. That part is pretty free, pretty easy to do. All right, let's talk about the budget itself. 
Most important thing, and this is true for all areas of the progress, read and follow the guidance documents carefully. Pay attention to what they say. Uh, also, this doesn't appear in the guidelines themselves, but if you're selected for an award, you will get an email saying you've been selected for an award and now our administrative people will talk to you and they'll have some questions for you. So in your budget, you wanna be prepared for that scrutiny from the administrative review if you're selected for an award. So the budget actually has two purposes. One is to get selected and then others to anticipate the questions you shall be coming. A note here, the entire budget has to fit within the budget limit. The budget limit is not direct costs and then you put all these indirect costs on top of it. The budget limit includes all costs, direct costs, indirect costs, sub awards, consultants, fee, the profit, everything has to fit within those constraints. The uh, constraints list are, are the, the current amounts available and the current links of the phase one and phase two projects are listed here. And uh, it should be a separate bullet, but quite often there are two separate documents of guidelines. I mentioned the documents uh, to follow carefully. Quite often there's a funding opportunity announcement or a solicitation or no for no for a notice of funding opportunity. And then there's a separate document with application details. So you do have to check the first document to see if it refers to a second one to tell you more about the funding details, how you actually enter the stuff online. You notice the USDA uh, eight month waiver uh, or eight month length in phase one. Well, USDA, a lot of times eight months is not enough to do a project that requires use of props. You can usually request a waiver for up to 20 months with the USDA. Key point here, and this is true about all SBIR awards in all agencies. If it's an ST, SBIR award, the company must perform at least two thirds of the work according to the budget allocation. Consultants do not count within that. Sub awards do not count within that. Vendors do, travel does. If it's an STTR, the company must perform at least 40% of the work by the budget. In general, don't lose money on the project. The budget guidelines don't say this, but you want to have realism in your budget. Include all the reasonable expenses, including fringe benefits, overhead, GNA expenses. If you have a budget that has you losing money, that doesn't present a good image to the reviewer that you know what you're doing as a business. If you have money from other sources, and that's a way of meeting the project, say that your administrative expenses are are met by some investment money or some private money, you can say that, but you don't want to lose money on the project. Most of the budgets have a spreadsheet that you fill in online. So you come up with a little Excel spreadsheet, play around with it that is, uh, until you get it right and then enter it onto line. So just be prepared for that, to do it in Excel first and then go online. I mentioned the cost match. Cost match is not required or evaluated. You have a cost match, they'll ignore it in the evaluation. But if you're proposing a budget that's larger than what they can give you, and you're going to be able to meet that budget with other sources, you can point out how you're going to meet a larger budget than what you're proposing. That's a workable strategy. It's not officially counted as a cost match, but they will take into account when they are considering realism. Important areas not to include permanent equipment, especially if disallowed by the guidelines. NSF allows no permanent equipment in a phase one proposal. Commercialization, marketing expenses are not allowed as the core part of the project, except as allowed in the guidelines. And we're seeing more and more instances of this where the guidelines will allow some discrete amount of commercialization activity to be funded. NSF, for example, will allow you $20,000 for a Beat the Odds boot camp. Agencies will allow you $6,250 uh, $6, for a commercialization vendor if you request it. So there are an increasing number of commercialization options, but unless they're specified, you have to stick to the technical work for the SBIR funding. Patent expenses aren't fundable in any form. Basic research, literature research, this is earlier stage than SBIR, which is a transition program to move from a research page, research phase into an applied phase. 
All right, indirect costs. I get a lot of questions on indirect costs. So I'm gonna go over them fairly briefly here. So then I will pause to see if this will be, a, start collecting your questions because I will pause. Any expense not attributed to the specific project is an indirect cost. For every dollar that you spend on staff, you have some percent in addition that you were required to spend for supporting employer match on Medicare and Social Security or unemployment insurance. You've got these requirements that you must spend. In addition, you might have a vacation policy that allows people to take time off. You might have a um, 401k plan or some kind of IRA plan. You might have health insurance benefits. These are all fringe benefits that you have to pay. And the government realizes that those are legitimate expenses that you have to pay and they can't give you just the direct money or you lose money. So they allow you to tack a percentage on top of your direct costs to offset these indirect costs. Fringe benefits, as I mentioned, include the payroll taxes, the health insurance retirement, f and that's financial and administrative, which is also known as GNA, general and administrative, includes the kinds of costs that it takes just to keep the, running, the company running regardless of the project. You've got rent. Rent isn't allocable to any one project that you have, but it's needed for the company. Phone, utilities, time spent running the company, these are all allowable as indirect costs. But you can see there are two main ways here that people allocate indirect costs, a single tier and a two tier method. NSF tends to favor the single tier method where you don't assign fringe benefits separately to staff costs. You just include them into one large pool of indirect costs and fringe benefits that you apply, but you apply them to labor only. So as you see in the example here, Staff costs about $130,000. If you have other direct costs of 15,000, you get total direct costs of 145,000. The safe rate for the National Science Foundation is 50%. They allow you to just put 50% as your indirect late rate as long as you're charging to staff only. That would be 65,000 of that 145,000. So you have direct plus indirect costs of 210,000 fee of 7%, that's profit. You can do whatever you want to with it. That comes up to a $225,000 limit. The limit or budget, the limit now is 256K. It just went up in January. So this example is a $225,000 budget. And it uses the single tip cost kind of element on the right. A lot of times you can break it down into two, two tier element where you charge fringe of some percent directly to staff only. And then you charge GNA to total direct costs, including staff, including fringe, and including other direct costs. And you can see here how that works. B of 7% applies the same in both cases. Bottom line applies the same in both cases. And notice, key thing here, if you get a $225,000 award, by the time you have all these indirect costs loaded into the proposal, you get down to somewhere between 100 12 to $130,000 of actual direct staff costs. So that's a number that you work with. And that can go pretty quickly on a research and development proposal where you're running a lot of prototypes and doing a lot of development and hiring high grade, high quality software engineers. So you really don't have that $225,000 to spend on the whole staff effort. Staff effort is some portion of that. All right, let me take a break now and see if there are any questions. Catherine, has anything popped up? Nothing has popped up so far. Everybody, I think, is being very studious. Okay. Oh, then I will, con I will wait just one minute. You can look this over. Oh, you just got one. Could you okay. differentiate between vendors and contractors? This is from Divya Patil. Oh, yes, yes. That's an excellent point. Let me further talk about vendors and contractors and consultants because they often get confused and they are often um, all three of them on a proposal. A subcontractor is an institution that you hire to perform some work on the project that contributes to the scientific advancement. The classic case is a company at Research Park here at the University of Illinois subcontracts with the university for somebody in their lab to do some work that contributes to the research and development. 
they have a subcontract, it's with that institution. A consultant is an individual who works for the small business concern that's applying for the SBIR proposal. And that individual works directly for the SBC, small business concern, and doesn't go through any institution. They're just working as an, as an individual on their own. That's a consultant. A vendor is a company that provides services that are regular services under a standard published pricing agreement, usually, or a negotiated pricing agreement. A lab assay would be a standard service. You do some lab work, you send it off for an assay, they send you back the results. There's no contribution to the research and development. It's just a standard service that they apply. That is a vendor. And there are some gray areas, because sometimes the vendors really do a little bit more than just standard services, if in fact there's some inter interaction on the design of the research or the design of the work that they're doing. So there are some gray areas in this, as in many sections of the SBIR program. The important distinction is with SBIR rules, remember you have to do two thirds of the, pro, uh, the work yourself. A vendor counts as part of the two thirds of the company. A consultant and a contractor does not. They count as the part that's outside the two thirds. So important distinction, I'm glad you asked the question. Any others coming up yet, Kathy? Do you have to include vendor quotes in the proposal? You know, it's a good idea if they're more than 5000 especially if they're more than $5,000. $5,000 is a guideline in a couple of areas. Equipment that's less than $5,000, you usually charge as materials and supplies. You don't count it as equipment. So if you have a computer that's a $2,000 computer, that's not equipment. That's officially materials and supplies. If you've got a vendor, to answer your question more directly, that's charging you $10,000 to do several runs of $500 an hour runs on their equipment, and they're doing 20 of these runs, then yeah, you should probably include a quote from them because that's substantial. But if their quote is under $5,000, you might not have to include it. If the quote's handy though, might as well. You know, if, they, if you've got a quote from them, stick it in the budget as part of the budget justification. If it's on a website, Take a copy of the website, stick that in the budget justification, that works just fine. All right. I believe those are the only two questions we've had so far. All both, right. Keep, keep thinking of the questions. Both of that information have, have thanked you. Oh, yeah. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for the questions. Keep thinking about it. I work better when I respond to questions because then I know I'm addressing the concerns that you have and not the concerns that I think you might have. Indirect costs, I mentioned that before. Most startup businesses do not have a negotiated indirect cost rate. If you do happen to have one, go ahead and use it. But most of you haven't negotiated a rate with any cognizant government agency like the University of Illinois has. And so you have to use some other rate. You can either use a safe rate if the funding agency has to have a, happens to have established one, or can come up with your own rate that's based on your own historical records and you support. If you use the safe rate, no questions asked. With NSF, the safe rate is 50% of labor only. With NIH, it's 40% of a modified total direct cost base, which may which excludes equipment. It, it includes only the first $25,000 of subcontractors. It includes travel uh, and other expenses. You, USDA is pretty stingy. They have a de minimis rate of 10%. So if you don't have a NICRA, then you have to lose money with USDA. They'll reimburse you only 10% unless you want to be ready to justify a higher rate. If you've got the way to do that, if you've got a historical record and have the adjust uh, a higher rate, you can justify it. But you have to be prepared to negotiate for that when you get selected for an award. That's part of the administrative review. USDA will come back and they'll say, well, you didn't use our de minimis rate of 10%. You're proposing a higher rate. Can you prove that that's your real rate? If you're prepared to do that, great. Go ahead and get the higher rate. In most cases, not. All right, other specific sections of the budget personnel section. Um, make sure you observe the minimum time requirements in the budget. For NSF, the PI is required 
to work a minimum of one month on the project for every six months of project effort. If it's a six month effort, the PI works one month. If it's a 12 month effort, the PI works two months minimum. For NIH, it's 10% time. USDA doesn't have a time requirement. Every agency is different here and you have to read the guidelines carefully. I mentioned before in general, don't work for free. Don't put zero dollars as your requested amount because you're putting in sweat equity and you're willing to do this for the company. It doesn't set a good precedent and it doesn't provide a really good message to uh, the government because you know they're, they're set up to pay you for this. The SBIR program is set up to reimburse you for cash dollars. If you want to work for free, the way to do that is to receive money from the grant and then turn around and write a check contributing it back to the company as paid in capital. You can do that, that's perfectly fine. But you want to show that the grant is paying you money. Senior personnel are those who have a substantial contribution to the project. You also have an other personal personnel classification. The other personnel classification, uh, software programmer, engineers, standard kind of fair. The other personnel you can put to be determined in the proposal and you can say what they're gonna do and what their role is gonna be and what their qualifications are gonna be. Senior personnel, you can't be to be determined. You have to see who they are. You have to include their bio sketch. Sometimes you have no charge faculty, especially in a sub award. That happens all the time because you're using the faculty to oversee a grad student or some undergrads in a lab space. That's perfectly fine, by the way, in a subcontract. Also a note for NSF, a business owner cannot be paid for a sub through a sub award. If you own the business, then let's say you're a university faculty member and you actually are part over an owner of a business and the business then subcontracts the university, then you cannot be paid as a faculty member through the subcontract. You have to be paid by the company. It's a company employer kind of situation. Also, incidentally, if you have, if you're in that kind of situation, you will have to go through a review from uh, the in Illinois, it's the Office of Vice Chancellor for Research and other institutions, it may be a similar office, but they will review your processes and procedures, your arrangement for conflicts of interest and provide a conflict of interest stake. Equipment, uh, as I mentioned before, if it's less than $5,000, it's not equipment. NSF, you can't have any equipment, so everything you have to get in is $5,000 or less. And don't try to price a $25,000 piece of equipment as five $5,000 purchases. NSF will detect that. They won't let you get away with it. Neither will the other institutions. Um, you know, as a general guideline, it's a good idea not to exceed 10% of the budget for equipment, or it looks like you're not doing enough real work. It looks like you're just using the SBAR to hire up a, to equipment for the company, to buy equipment for the company. That's not a good message. Another word on equipment, if you do buy equipment, the government owns it. It is not yours. And at the end of the contract, you will have to arrange for the disposition. The government officially owns it, and you'll have to arrange for them to take it back. Now, in practice, they never do, or rarely. What they do is they fill out paperwork and they say, no, we don't want a now five-year-old computer. You can have it. But you do have to arrange for the disposition of it. Travel, no foreign travel. Uh, NSF travel is required. Other agencies usually don't require travel to a workshop. Um, also, don't put in conference travel to, or trade shows unless it's for technical work. You can't have a travel to a trade show just to advertise your company and find out what people like. That's commercialization work. You can fund that if you're doing it as part of a Beat the Odds boot camp. It's commercialization, but you can't fund it in the straight technical work. Don't have any participant support costs. These are rare. You usually don't have them. So never mind that column. You use a participant support cost, say if you wanted to pay people to come and try out your product and give you feedback on it. And you wanted to pay them $20 just to try them out or to use it. That would be an example of a participant support cost, but they're usually disallowed in phase one SBIR proposals. Your several other direct costs yeah, category. Oh yeah, let's hear it. If you don't mind me jumping in. Yeah, please. Um, it is how can non-technical employees working on administration operations or business development be compensated? They are compensated. Yes, yes, that's right. And it's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. They 
are compensated as part of your general and administrative expenses. That kind of cost comes in the GNA category. Because usually a person working in that category is not working on a specific project. Usually that person is working to advance the marketing interests of the entire company. So it's a GNA expense and it's included in that 50% overhead that NSF allows or whatever percent you've established for your GNA rate. Did that get what you wanted? Looks like it did. This person thanks you. Okay, fine. Anything else while we're paused? Yes, one more person asked as a follow up to that can this include a board member? Um, you, can, you can pay board members out of GNA, yes. And the reason I hesitate a little bit is because it's a gray area. There are several kinds of expenses that you cannot include in your indirect expenses. Organizational costs are one of them. The costs of setting up an organization is one thing you cannot include. But a compensation for a board member is something that you can include in the GNA expenses. General marketing and advertising expenses you cannot include in the GNA expenses. If you hire an ad to recruit personnel and tell people how great your company is, that is not include, include allowable as a GNA expense. If you go to a trade show and set up a booth just to show people how great your technology is in general and what a fine company you have, which I'm sure you do, that is not allowable as a GNA expense because advertising is, is not allowable. Most to the point, and this comes up for most of the SBR work that's being done, patent expenses themselves are not allowable. You hire a lawyer and pay them $10,000 to help you with the patent. That is not an allowable expense in GNA. That has to come out of either investment money or the fee. Note that you've got a 7% fee. You can do whatever you want to with that. You can fly to Hawaii if you want to with that. You can give everybody a bonus if you want to with that. You can pay late fees if you want to with that, but you can't do the kinds of things that I mentioned as part of the GNA. So good point to bring up. Thank you. I think that's all for right now. Okay, very good. All right. If you have materials and supplies and you do, make sure you give a good list of them, a nice detailed listing. Show the breakdown. We're going to buy X of this unit, X of Y unit. And you know how, how do you know that? If the costs are ramping up, if the costs here too get to be like $5,000 or more, good idea to include a quote. It's okay to put other miscellaneous supplies. No one minds this. You put other miscellaneous supplies and you kind of list the nature of the supplies and then you put a dollar amount on. And the other miscellaneous supplies, by the way, is a great place to fudge your proposal so that it comes out to exactly the amount allowed. So this is a real good place to put that number in to get the amount that's allowed. And there's no stigma against producing a proposal that's exactly the allowed amount. It happens more often than not. Everybody knows that the guiding limit to how much you can propose is that amount. And you will figure out how much you can do realistically with that amount of money. So you, you are more or less expected to propose that amount. No points gained for proposing something less than looking like a good guy ahead and propose to the full amount and the materials and supplies is one good way to fudge the amount so that it comes out exactly right. Another good way, by the way, is with the fee percent. You're allowed up to 7%, but if 6.5% makes the every number workable and the total number come out right, that's a good place to fudge a little bit so the end number comes out right. Now, someone asked about consultants. There is a limit to the amount that you can pay consultants with some agencies. You have to look to the agency to see what it is. USDA has a limit, 629 per day, which isn't very much. Uh, NSF has a maximum limit of $1,000 a day. It was uh, $600 up until December of 2017, and then it went up to $1,000. And so even that's a lot less than what a lot of people make as a consultant. In, this, in these technical professions. So make sure a consultant is okay with these restrictions 
and make sure you don't propose any more than that in your budget. A couple of words about subcontracts. These are organizations that you're working with. The subcontractor in most proposals has to enter its own budget at the same level of detail and with its own budget justification as a small business concern. So when you're working with a subcontract uh, and you're looking at your timeline, allow several weeks to make sure you can get that from the organization. The University of Illinois likes to have about four weeks in advance. They like to give you the materials a couple weeks in advance so that they're all set to go on your proposal. And they like a couple weeks before that to work on the statement of work and to send it through all of their bureaucracy. Uh, oh, another word about subcontracts in the National Science Foundation Fastlane interface. Subcontract also has to be registered in Fastlane. In most cases, they're universities. In most cases, they are. But when you go to enter their budget, Fastlane, the NSF's interface, will ask you what the um, what the their uh, identification is in Fastlane, and it'll expect them to be registered. Other budget expenses, vendor, again, uh, if it's $5,000 or more, it's a good idea to provide a quote. If it's less, you usually don't have to. There is a, a, another category called other. So it's other, other. This is for anything else, the lab assays, the services, fees that you pay. NSF allows you to have an auditor uh, up to $10,000 for a CPA to help you set up your books. NSF also allows Beat the Odds Boot Camp. Others offer commercialization uh, assistance. I mentioned the $6,250 is available from NIH. That would go in this other category. And then the fee, as I mentioned, 7%. You can do with it whatever you want to. No reason not to request it. You don't get any points for not requesting it. So you might as well go ahead and ask for it. Again, it's a good place to fudge if you want the numbers to come out just right. I will talk next about what to put in the budget justification, but let me pause now to see if there are any other questions on the budget. So. so currently nothing is on the chat, but if somebody does have something they'd like to ask, please go ahead and throw it on chat. All right, yeah, very good. You will have to have a budget justification. Um, in general, there will be a section in the budget justification for each section in the budget. In the budget. It's a separate document that you do in Word and make a PDF out of it and upload separately. You don't have to reiterate every single calculated total in the budget justification. And sometimes you've got a page limit with the budget justification. NSF officially has a page limit of three pages for the budget justification. If you have a lot of consultants, you'll easily exceed that and they tell you you can do that. So don't worry about the page limit if you have called consultants. But if you're just explaining the budget itself, you want to observe that page limit. Ah, for staff. Oh, yeah. Say there's a question. Well, I was saying so far there are no questions. Oh, okay. For staff, um, include the role, what they'll be doing on the project, person months of work, or the hours of work, their base rate, and their requested rate. Don't include their qualifications. Qualifications go elsewhere. I've seen several proposals recently where they try and stuff the budget justifications with the qualifications of the people, and this is not the place for it. They go elsewhere. Now, with, with the National Science Foundations, there's a op, occupation code, a series of occupation codes from the Bureau of Labor Standards. And even though it is not required in the proposal, it's a good idea to look up that's the occupation of each person and find a BLS SOC for each one and list that in the proposal. This is to anticipate the administrative review. If you don't have it, your proposal will not be refused. But if you don't have it and you're selected for an award, it will come back and say you're selected for award and you've got these terrible errors in your proposal. You didn't give us the SOC codes from your BLS website, and you must fix these egregious errors. They give you this real harsh stuff, and it makes you sound like you're in default, even though you've met all the requirements. But that's normal. That's par for a course. Don't be thrown by that. 
But you can anticipate that by putting the SOC code, the occupation code, in the uh, budget justification to begin with. For fringe benefits, you can say we're using the safe rate and just say what it is. You can kind of mention in general what's included. If fringe benefits are included in the FNA rate, then you just say they're included in the FNA rate. And the same kind of thing for the indirect costs at the bottom of this slide. Explain the general basis, how you're using the rate. You don't have to show the calculations, but you have to kind of describe what's in it. Travel, be careful, no travel out of the country. And this is a problem for a lot of people who are doing work with foreign countries. They can't travel to Venezuela to work with people in Venezuela unless you get a special waiver. Sometimes you can. Any trip besides the required trips, give a breakdown. Don't just say we're gonna take, take two trips to some conference and we're estimating $1,000. You can say we're taking two trips to the grantee workshop for NSF and we're charging $4,000, that's fine. But on other chips, you have to break them down. Other direct costs uh, in the budget justification, this is where you list them all. Here's where you include the price quotes as an attachment. Um, consultants and sub awards include in the budget description what they'll be doing. And sometimes that's a separate letter and an attachment. Sometimes, it's not a separate letter and attachment. Sometimes it goes in some other section of the proposal. You have to read the guidelines carefully and make sure you know where for this particular agency they want to see that information. All right, um, I've got showing next a hypothetical budget, hypothetical USDA budget. It's three screens showing three different sections of the budget. But I'll give a little bit of time on each screen for you to absorb how it's absorbed and what it looks like. This is the Excel version. It's not what you end up putting online, but this is the Excel version. But I'll put up the screens, give you a couple of minutes to absorb them. And then as you're absorbing them, you can ask questions. And after that, we're done with the budget and I'll move on to some other areas. So here's a hypothetical USDA budget. You can see the senior, the different categories in personnel senior personnel and an other personnel section. Key people are there, they will have to have a um, description in the budget certification. They will have to have a current and pending report. Usually they will have to have a bio sketch. The other personnel will not have to have bio sketches. You can see that uh, this USDA does allow equipment. So we've got a couple of pieces of equipment here. They're $5,000 and more. So we went ahead and listed them as equipment would provide price quotes in the budget justification. Roland, real quick, if you don't mind, I'd love to ask a question here that was brought up by uh, one of our participants, um, maybe taking a step back, I hope you don't mind. Is the SBIR boot camp considered a grantee workshop? No, they are different things. The grantee workshop is an administrative view of the requirements of the the grant of, of executing the grant. And it's also an opportunity to meet in person with your program manager. So it's contractual information, it's meet with the program manager. The Beat the Odds Boot Camp is a few weeks of customer discovery. You meet weekly via video conference, you present the customer discovery, you go out and interview at least 30 people during the Beat the Odds Bootcamp. The Beat the Odds Bootcamp is a mini i -Core. Now, NSF structures it so that the Beat the Odds Bootcamp comes up just before or ends right at the grantee workshop. So it's, it's you know, they, they time it. So you do the Beat the Odds Bootcamp and then at the grantee workshop, you meet the program manager and you discuss your Beat, beat the Odds Bootcamp results. So, you know, here we've got um, the next section, some travel and um, some uh, materials and supplies with their own totals there. They would be detailed in the budget justification. We've got a consultant online here and uh, we have sub awards. The Starfleet Academy is a sub award in this case. It would have to submit its own budget and its own budget justification. We've got a total of the direct costs and you can see all the detailed totals at the bottom here see that we've got a modified total direct cost base. It includes some of the elements, but not all of the elements. 
got total uh, indirect costs, and then we've got a 7% fee on top of it, and this request is the USDA limit of $100,000. Anything on budgets before we move on? Does travel have to be based on GSA per diem? Yes, you should not request more than is allowed for GSA per diem. The per diem portion of your travel. A per diem for travel, uh, this gets into some details we won't go into now because it takes a little bit of time, but the official GSA per diem includes several items. It includes meals, it includes re personal reimbursement for meals, uh, if you go that route. It includes some lodging. And so you have to look and see what the G what's included in the GSA rate. If you use the GSA per diem rate, you can request that, that rate, but you have to see what's included and see what's not. Well, airfare will not be included in the, in the GSA per diem. So you can ask that, add that separately. That's a good question because you do have to look carefully can't just use a per diem, it won't capture all of your expenses. Thank you, I think that's the only question we have so far. All right, I will talk about some other areas of the proposal that, don't, that aren't covered in the other sections. I will not talk about commercialization, I will not talk about marketing. Jed has those covered very well. He, he went over some of those in the previous session and he'll do that in even greater detail in the third session. And that's very important. That's the mo each round, the commercialization and letters of support section becomes more and more important. So you need to pay attention to what Jed has to say on those. I will talk about a couple of areas here. One is technical uh, plan and the project objectives, because this is an area that often gets gets misaligned and gets gets uh, poorly represented. When you present project objectives, remember this is a feasibility study. It's a demonstration that the technology proposing has a glimmer of working. It's not a full-blown prototype necessarily, although it can be. It's not a full-blown working version. It might be just a lab prototype, but it's a technical feasibility. You have to show that your technology will do something phenomenal. And at least chance, stands a chance of doing something phenomenal. So you have to say what those objectives are in terms of technical performance and not in terms of research questions. You don't want to ask questions. You know, we will come up with a list of the most popular factors that, that make this kind of technology excite, excitable among potential users. That's a marketing research question. And I'm constantly driving people away from the marketing research questions to the actual technical performance here. You need to say what results are and how will you, you will measure them. You want to make it so these technical objectives make the case for phase two funding. Phase one, of course, has the goal of achieving phase two. And if you demonstrate success on specific phase one objectives, then you've written most of your phase two proposal already. You say, here's what we said we would do in phase one. Here's how we said we would measure it. Here are the results we said we would have. And we did it. Here are the results we obtained. Here are the results we said we would have. We weren't able to do that, but we were able to do something different. Here's what we were able to do instead. Here's a pivot. Here's what didn't work. Here's what did work. But you have to base it on actual performance measurements. SMART is a very good metric for this. It's a very good mnemonic. Goals need to be specific. You gotta say exactly what it's gonna do, measurable, how you're gonna measure them. You gotta be realistic. It's gotta be something that the technology really can do in phase one. There's a tendency to overreach in phase one, avoid that. You have to be relevant to the work at hand and they have to be time bound. You've gotta be able to accomplish it by the end of the proposal period, so smart. You can use this mnemonic to think through your goals. I will say a little bit more about relevance. This is a sometimes problem, is that if you've got one group writing the commercialization plan because they're real good at marketing, or maybe you've hired a consultant to help you, and another group writing the technical plan because they're really smart technically, sometimes you get a technical plan that proves a technology that doesn't necessarily support the features and functionality that the marketing team has discovered are important to the customers. So there's a mismatch there. 
you have to make sure that these technical objectives really do support the gaps, the technical gaps that are apparent from the commercialization plan. They have to show innovation, they have to show technical risk. You don't want to say, we're sure this whole thing is going to work because we've done most of the work already and we've got early prototypes and you know, we're confident this is going to work. There's no justification for SBIR funding if you're that confident it's going to work. The SBIR program funds high risk work, it funds innovative work. If there's not risk, there's not innovation. They know that. So you have to have an element of risk. And phase one's goal is to de risk that by taking the riskiest aspects of your proposal, riskiest aspects of your technology, de risking them and proving that they will work. And then you can go ahead and flesh it out in phase two. Will it work? Answer that question in your goals. Will the resulting technology actually work? How can we prove in a minor, small feasibility demonstration that the whole thing will work? And again, don't try to do too much. Feasibility only, phase one. Tendency to overreach. Everybody will realize that limited amount of money, you only got what, around 120K of actual direct time to do it. Uh, that's not a lot. Make sure that it's realistic. Also, some catchwords to watch out for. Investigate, characterize, review literature, identify factors, study. These are research genericals. They're not specific performance goals. Avoid them. Let's look quickly at some weak objectives. I won't read them out loud to you, but I'll give just a minute here for you to look over these objectives. And you can see as you review them, they're kind of wishy-washy. They're kind of market-oriented. They don't tell you exactly what you'll accomplish. They sort of describe an area you will think about and you could do any kind of activity in any of number of areas and claim to have achieved these objectives. So, you know, they're, they're, you can't, your feet can't be held in the fire here. That's not appropriate. That's not helpful to you. You want something where you can say, here's what we said we would do, and we did it. Here are some examples of stronger objectives. They say very specifically, we will develop something, we will create, will make something, it will perform to these specifications. That's the kind of goal that you want in your stronger objectives. Here's what it will do, here's how we're gonna prove it. And then when you write your phase one report, you say, here's what we said we would do, we proved it, and that is the best case possible for your phase two proposal. The work plan itself, I've got a bunch of bullets here, detailed, realistic, specific, here, the only thing I'll mention here, I won't go through the bullets, but the only thing I'll mention here is this is the place in the proposal where it's okay to be technical, where you really want to strut your stuff from a technical standpoint. You want to refer to the science. You want to prove to the people that you're moving the state of the art forward, that you're enhancing the global body of knowledge, that you're producing something that has never been done before technically. You can have big charts here, detailed charts that you have to read, understand. You know, wavy charts with lots of graphs, put them here. You can be very technical. And this is a good place to build your bibliography as well. You can say, here's the technology that we're building upon. And you have a lot of references. It's state of the art, it's the latest. It was just published last year, but we're gonna take it a step further. And here's what we're gonna do, except here's how we're gonna modify. Show you're aware of the state of the art, show how you're pushing it forward. Here's where you demonstrate technical feasibility. Jed will mention in his next session, when you get to the review panel, the reviewers will be half marketing and half technical, at least for NSF. Technical people will kind of gloss over the marketing stuff and they'll really glom on to these technical details. Here's where you satisfy those technical people that you really are state-of-the-art people. And the technical people NSF can get are leaders in the field. They will get someone who's the latest in the field. They will know exactly what's going on and they will say, is my work represented here? <laughs> and in your bibliography, by the way, they will say, is my work represented here? They'll look for the bibliography to see if they're mentioned. So you want to write this for that heavily technical audience. All right, finally, main area here, format. This, get, this is a very important way to make your proposal stand out that is often overlooked. The reviewer will have maybe 10 proposals to review. Each proposal, by the time you get all the bio sketches and the cover material and, and uh, the content itself, 
you know, you're talking 50 or more pages. So you've got like 500 pages of text that the reviewer is looking at. That is a ream of paper. Hold it up in your hand. That's what the reviewer has to go through. That reviewer is not going to read every single page of every single proposal. They'll see the proposal. They will skim. They will look for key points. And so your key points have to pop out at them. You want it so that a reviewer can glance through the key points. They can read the summary. They can look at the graphics. They can look at the elevator pitch. They can look at the bio sketches. They can look at the key areas. They can look at the letters of support. And they can say, ooh, I get this. Instantly they say, ooh, this is important. Instantly they say, this is a game changer. You know, this is something we really have to have. So that big deal has to pop out of them from the beginning. You want an, an upside down format for what you typically see in an academic publication. In an academic publication, you lay out all the support for your argument to lead to an inevitable irrefutable conclusion at the end of the document. Not so in a SBR proposal. You want that inevitable conclusion to come first, and then you support it. So it's kind of upside down from what academics are used to doing. And you want to top down. Two questions here. One of them, I think, is a little bit uh, closer to the topic. Um, how do you handle describing IP in the work plan? Um, Boy, that, that's a good question. A whole session could be done on that. Let me see if I can address the main points here. It's important to say the current state of the IP. It's important to say where it is now. If you have proprietary information and you need to disclose that proprietary information in the proposal, there are ways to protect it. And pay attention to the guidelines and notice how you protect it. The guidelines are usually set up to protect IP. They're usually set up so you check a box, you have a legend, you say which pages it appears on, and in the text itself, you mark those as proprietary pages. If you can talk about the IP without going into proprietary detail, that's the best, just to avoid it. Then you avoid the problem. I guess, I guess twofold then, if talking about IP, if this is the question you're answering, one is to talk about the state of it. Have you filed a provisional? Have you filed a utility? Are you thinking about providing, applying for a provisional? Have you done original search just to see if there are competing patents out there? Those are main stages you usually wanna talk about. And then the second answer to your question, if there is proprietary information that you need to disclose in order to make your case, make sure you protect it appropriately with the guidance as the as presented by the agency. Is that the question that you were asking? See if that person uh, responds. Um, there was another question. It takes a few steps back. Uh, in, so yes, that, your answer did uh, cover okay. that question. So All right. um, the other question, if you want to handle this at the end when we do general Q&A, that's fine too. But the question is, can an NSF funded center like an ERC be, sub, be a sub awardee to a potential NSF SPIR company? Uh, an ERC, I'm not sure. FFRDC, yes, that's a federally funded research and development company. So the FFRDCs are allowable. They can't be funded by the NSF grant. You can work with them and you have to get a letter from them, but they can't receive funds from the grant. Argonne National Laboratories here in Illinois is a great example. That's an FFRDC. And they can't be funded as a sub-awardee, but if they're key to the grant, then you get a letter from them and they do that. So I'll go ahead and answer that question now. Thank you very much. I think that's all we have so far. All right, another formatting item. Uh, and here's our example. Use, use subheads to, to convey information. You know, when you scan through proposal, you often look at the headers and the subheads. The headers of the main sections have to be exactly as prescribed in the proposal, but not the subheads. So you want to use subheadings to bring your key points to the fore. So if you have a subhead that says summary, that 
tells the reader that the key piece of information you're communicating and that you're using the space for, you're telling them this contains a summary. That is not telling them a lot about the proposal. Same thing, you know, if have background, key piece of information that you're, uh, that you're imparting with this precious space is you have to read more to find the background. Instead, you can bring content summaries and main points into the section subheads. Proposed technology can reduce infant deaths by 6%. All right, you know, if I see that as a subhead, I instantly think, oh, this is important. I want to read more about this. You've got the key point built into the subhead. $116 billion a year in the US is in crop loss due to heat stress. Oh, this, this technology is going to address something really important. So build main points into the subheads, the valuable space. You don't want to waste it by just telling people the nature of what follows. You actually want to summarize content in these subheads. Graphics I'll mention, use them in the front sections if they do in fact replace 10,000 words. That's a good guideline. It's, it's, a, it's an aphorism, but in fact, do it. Um, clear, compelling, easy and quick to understand. Make sure they communicate value to the customer, user experience, overall advantage, technological innovation. So a person can look at the grant in three seconds and say, oh, I get it. I see what this does. I see how it helps. I see why people would want it. And give it some professional polish. It doesn't have to be detailed, but some professional polish. Here's an example, development proposal guideline. I won't go over the timeline right now, but it's there for review. It covers the same kind of materials Jed has talked about. But notice, you know, start a good 10 weeks ahead of time, start a good three or four months ahead of time in order to make sure you've got plenty of time before you submit for reviews or the time that it takes to go back and forth and really mature the proposal. The difference between a good proposal and a really highly competitive proposal, in my experience, is the highly competitive proposals have a lot of interaction when they think they're done. They're near the end of the draft and then they spend a few more weeks Hashing out points between experts. Here are some resources that are available to you. I won't go over them. It's in the slides. In addition to these resources, there are uh, some resources from the previous session that we've updated, and those will be available to you when you take the survey. Catherine will tell you about the survey. I will leave these uh, for you to look at more detail when you download these, because these slides are available at the end as well. And Here's our sponsors. We are grateful for all the good work they did to organize the Midwest iNode to make it available to you and all the great capabilities and support that we have here. The time is up officially, but I'm glad to stick around for any questions anybody has. And I'll turn it, turn it all over to Catherine now because you want to talk about the survey and how they can obtain the resources. Yes, so I do see a couple of questions coming in. Uh, if please do uh, go ahead and type your questions in and I will ask them uh, at the end of my final housekeeping notes here. Um, first things first is yes, I will be sending out another email. Um, most of you, I think, were on the first email because you participated in last week's uh, webinar. Um, I understand there may have been a, a glitch in a couple of the links. I apologize. I think we've got that all settled. So this time uh, you should receive both documents um, when you when you do the survey um, and uh, it all should be well this time. So thank you so much for your kind feedback on that. Uh, we think we've got that fixed. So. Um, when I do get the report, it might be the end of today. I think things are running a little slow with WebEx. Um, I will send it out as soon as I uh, get the report um, back from who all was here, and I will set it. It might be tomorrow by the time I actually get uh, get this out. So thank you for your patience, and thank you for doing the survey. Um, the survey is very important for us because it helps us make sure that we're addressing your needs and um, and, and and doing a good job. So um, it would be very helpful for us to, for you to do that. Um, and with that, I will start at the top of the most recent questions list. Um, first one is, is it possible to do SBIR in phase one and STTR in phase two? I don't know if, yeah, I'll just let you answer that question. It's, it's agency dependent. NIH allows you to switch and they say that. NSF currently expects you to continue. If you wanted to switch, you would have to get special dispensation to do that. But in phase two, the requirement to do an STTR is a little different. In 
phase two, if it's an SBIR, the small business concern has to do only 50% of the work. And so if you've got a subcontractor that's doing 40% of the work, you would have to have an STTR in phase one. But if they're doing 40% of the work, they could just be part of the rules of an SBIR in phase two. So usually you don't switch unless, NI, unless it's NIH or unless the agency allows it. And these things are changing you know, year by year. The, uh, the agencies are constantly coming up with evolving new rules, so you have to check. But the uh, reason to go to STTR with phase two is a little different because the requirements for what the subcontractor can do and what the submitting firm can do are a little different. The submitting firm in phase two has to do 50%, not a whole two thirds. Uh, so the next question is, could or should the outcome of phase one feasibility research be an MVP? Is that acceptable? It's, it's acceptable. If it is, that's good. If you're that far along. You know, my general caution here is don't stretch your projects to try and meet some notion of what you think the goal ought to be. Do what you realistically can do. If in fact, in a phase one, you can come up with an MVP, great, go for it. If in fact, in a phase one, you really can't, you really can only come up with some kind of a lab demonstration in a controlled environment of what the technology can do, then don't say you're gonna produce an MVP just because you think you have to, because you don't have to. The closer you can get, obviously, the better, but don't stretch. Make sure whatever you're doing is realistic Uh, the next question I think is one I can answer. It's could we get the recordings of the presentations? Um, I did mention this at the beginning. You may not have uh, jumped on by then. Uh, I do believe there's a place that we can post this. Um, I think we have some older versions of this posted um, in conjunction with one of our counterparts on campus. So I'm going to be exploring that um, and then we can send out send out the information to the group once we have that uh, once we have that all settled. So thank you for ans uh, asking that question. Um, I think we should be able to make these available uh, shortly. Um, and the next question is, do the review boards assume that personnel will be 100% on the proposed project or are they normally partially on the project? Rarely are they 100% on the project. Usually it's partial. In fact, if you put somebody for 12 person months, 100% correct on a project, that means they'll never take any vacations. That means they'll never take any time off and that's not realistic and so you probably want to have people on a, pro a direct technical to the project maximum around 80 percent 85 percent time but even the pi you know uh can be what 10 percent on the project or one person month on the project out of six so they don't expect you to be a hundred percent on the project in fact, if you put 100% on the project, you're proposing something that at the outset is not realistic. Thank you. Uh, last question so far that I see here is how common is it for non-university affiliates to be, excuse me, to apply for SBIR? And do you know the success rate? Are there other resources available for non-university applicants? Um, SBIR funds only non-university companies. SBIR funds only for-profit entities. So you have to be not a university to apply. Whether you're affiliated with the university is another matter, but you can't be a not-for-profit, you can't be a research institution and apply. You have to be a self-standing for-profit company. And let's see, the second question, the success rate, you know, the success rate on proposals is actually going up in the last year or so. The traditional success rate has been around 10, 12% for the past few years. But in recent years, the agencies are reporting sometimes more like 15%, sometimes towards 20% success rate on a phase one proposal. The success rate on phase two proposals is very high. It's 50% the phase two proposals get funded. 
Now, a lot of times that is because you've done phase one. You know if you succeeded or not. If you haven't succeeded, you don't bother writing a phase two. But it's also because the program is designed for phase one to lead to phase two. So the phase two proposal, a high success rate, is built into the nature of the proposal. But for phase one, you can generally think around 15% these days as a standard success rate, maybe even 15 to 20 based on what I hear from the agencies. Thank you. So I don't see any more questions on here. Um, Roland, are you okay if I give your email address in the follow-up email to everybody? Ooh, one, yeah, one yeah. More person, um, the person who just asked the last question has asked uh, a follow-up to it to clarify, how common is it for people without joint faculty appointments to apply? For people without joint faculty appointments to apply? Um, Maybe I wonder if this is like um, IP that may have originally come from the university, but yeah, maybe licensed I, I back just, out as a private company um, that somebody's suspect, pursuing. I, I, I wonder. This is probably that. a question that you know. There's something individual that you have in mind that you're asking, but don't want to ask and give away too many details. So, if that's the case, make sure you get in touch with me, and Catherine will send the my email in the follow up. And I'll try and monitor my spam bin a little more closely in the next few days to see if anybody shows up. If you put something conspicuous, you know, how about putting something conspicuous like you know, SBR presentation in the subject line? That will help me see it if it shows up in my spam bin. And I'll try and monitor for that. But you, most of the time, you cannot be a university faculty member and the PI on an SBIR proposal because the SBIR requires that you work 51% time or more for the company and no more than 20% time for any other company. And faculty members on a joint appointment, unless their faculty appointment is less than 50%, could not be a PI on a proposal. So to answer the face, the surface of the question, most of the time the PI applicants, the PIs, are not joint university but, and that yeah, may have some... answered the question. I think this. I think this person uh, may have gotten their answer. But um, you know, as as Roland said, if anybody, uh, including Albert, have uh, follow up questions that you want to ask, um, I will be including Roland's email address in the follow up email. You're welcome to reach out directly to him with those questions. Yeah, so, I love love to get the questions, and I appreciate everybody's questions. So I think with that, um, I don't see any additional questions. So I think we're gonna go ahead and sign off. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, please keep an eye out for an email from me uh, in the next probably 24 hours. Hopefully it will be much sooner than that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Ready. Right. Bye.